Hey, superstars, welcome back to another episode of Word Up with Danny Katz. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Mr. Shane Sador, also known as The Ruiner. <laughs> Shane has been on my radar for a few years, and I was really excited to drop in with Shane because he has a very, very unique set of formative experiences and a very, very unique macro perspective on our planet, our human evolution, on the crisis slash transformation we are navigating. And I was really intrigued to get Shane's unique take on where we're at, how it's unfolding, how he thinks this is gonna go, if there are any sort of X factors or pivots we can take, how we can make this transition as easy and graceful on ourselves as possible. So we had a fantastic conversation. It was so rich and deep on so many levels that I was not inspired to break in the middle of the conversation to delineate the space between the free first half conversation and then the second half, which is available for my locals supporters as well as for my Patreon patrons. That being said, I am still splitting the conversation. So please enjoy this first half. And as you are inspired, find the second half at my Patreon or on my locals where your support gets you access to all of my second half conversations and all of my bonus content. And with that, please buckle up and enjoy this fantastic, rollicking, super out there conversation with Shane Sador. I'm so happy to finally get to drop in with you, the ruiner. <laughs> the fucking ruiner, I think is the, the, the evolution of the name, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about that name? It seems so um, anathema to like your mild mannered demeanor. Well, I mean, I wrote the blog from a kind of character point of view, right? Like it wasn't really me that I was writing from if that makes sense the voice I was using wasn't my own obviously it was meant to be anonymous when I wrote it so it wasn't um and I wasn't speaking to the public I was speaking to a small group of people that I know personally so it was kind of written behind a character anyways I guess if looking back on it sometimes I think that I would have named it something a lot cooler if um I had have known that it was going to stick around for forever I could have probably come up with a better name but um that was a nickname that I had that a lot of the people that I was originally writing for knew me as so um I guess in a way it's kind of cool that it was immortalized <laughs> and why were people calling you the ruiner well, just because uh, it started with one of the handlers that I had, actually, it's she, the way she put it is like, you ruin everything I try to get you involved with, basically, right? And she was just like, she kept saying ruiner. And she would just kind of say that. And um, yeah, I guess that's where it came. A couple of people heard her say it and repeated it and like, oh, yeah, this is the ruiner. I, I'd hear that every once in a while more than she was pretty much the only one who would say it to me, but I would hear it about me often and kind of stuck like that. And I guess other people um, through those programs had heard that name as well, which is um, not uncommon. So, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So so the name came as far as like you being someone who would thwart the attempts of the handlers or the controllers to fuck with you or use you to do nefarious things? It was all in like program settings, right? Like you'd be in like a part of a program and that program has a specific goal or, out, or um, uh, it's supposed to have a specific effect. And for whatever reason, I would ruin that outcome or I would ruin that effect by my uh, I guess you could call it a defiance of it. It was just kind of a lot of the time where it really started was um, kind of in the topic that I was talking about earlier today in the in the simulations where they would kind of um, induce you into these dreamlike states that while you were in them, it was really hard to not tell that they were real, right? You would actually think that you were doing these things. And um, for most people, they would go in and out of them and not really know the difference between whether or not they just went and lived a day somewhere else or they just experienced this virtual reality i was always able to tell that no this isn't real right like um if you've ever seen the film divergent when she's in that kind of simulation and she goes this isn't real and she points at something right like it was it was very much like that and 
they would try different cocktails of drugs. They would try different electromagnetic frequencies. They would try augmenting different things. And for whatever reason, I would always be able to go, no, wait, this, is, this isn't real life. Um, get me out of this. And I would kind of stop participating and thereby ruining the simulation, right? Like I would actually just let myself be in whatever way taken out of the simulation and, and no longer play along with it. And uh, the way that they were designed because they are designed through computers and AI, you can get get stuck in like a loop pattern where the if there's not a participation with the program it stops running We're kind of like in a video game if you don't go to the right room you won't progress in the game right. a lot of these uh, simulations were set up that way too where certain milestones had to be hit and if they weren't then that would kind of they'd have to stop the pro stop the simulation and start over again so that's a basically uh a long uh, version of how it started. And then I just kept doing things like that and um, ruining her plans for me as well. Um, she would get me involved with certain things. And once again, I would kind of figure out what her scheme was and, and not buy into it. Basically what it came down to is I, I didn't want to be who they wanted me to be. And um, sorry, I forgot to move this earlier. And they had plans for me that I ruined in the end, so. Uh, some people were heavily invested in those plans. Okay, I have so many questions and I just want to acknowledge that this is our first time dropping in and that the plan was like, let's schedule just a regular chat. And I was the one who was like, ah, let's just do a Zoom thing and make it a podcast thing. And we are getting to know one another. So like, I'm inviting this to, to be a casual Shane Danny drop in slash, you know, I'll try to steer us where I'd like us to go, given that you're the ruiner. Um, and all this time, I had thought the ruiner, like in my mind, um, I consider myself like a binky stealer. Like I shatter people's worldviews by saying like, oh, that's fake. Oh, that's not what you think. And I, I had always assumed that the ruiner was somewhere along those lines, but you just took it to a completely different place. And I'm so curious to know like A, and apologies, because I know you've done so many of these interviews with so many people, and I really oh, want to take it to a different place. But I'm curious to know, like, how old you were and you were conscious? Like, you knew this was your handler. You knew that they were fucking with you. Like, how did that knowledge come about? Well, that was kind of what allowed me to have a kind of unique view of it is my memory doesn't, it takes a lot to shut it off. You know, like I've, I've actually personally experimented with like, say, how much alcohol do I have to drink before I actually start, stop remembering things. And that was the same type of thing as we all have that threshold, forget what the name of the part of the brain is, but there's like a, a very small membrane where that shuts off and you can no longer store memory. It's really hard to shut mine off for whatever reason. I've had this problem with anesthetics. I've had this problem with, um, recreational drugs that other people would find a lot more fun than I do because of this uh, control over that, I guess, is not being able to be hypnotized out of recognizing what is real or what is not. And it's also, I think, um, a kind of grounding in reality that I always wanted to maintain, that um, I was consciously aware of their ability to mess with us as well. So I always kind of assumed if anything strange was going on, that's probably what it is. It's probably not, you know, and when I say strange, I, I mean like, you know, I, I'm probably not on another planet fighting space aliens right now. Like that doesn't seem, I was at a public school yesterday. I'm probably not in a spaceship today. That's probably not what's going on. So even just um, having that level of logic, but that was it. Like it started when I was four and it was probably about 10, 11, years old 10 to 13 where they started to realize that they were having a really hard time programming me, like keeping me from being a autonomous person um i actually at about 13 had tried to whistle blow like quite legitimately by going to my family doctor and saying these things were being i'm being taken to these places all this stuff is going on and got a lot of people in trouble and it got nowhere and um <clears throat> after that i guess you know i I, I kind of felt defeated and that I was never going to be able to get out. I just kind of, um, I think I was around 13 when I kind of assumed that this is like, I live or die here, you know, like I'm, I'm not getting out of this. And so I, I did kind of just learn to 
participate, if that makes sense. Um, because I was consciously aware of the fact that they were doing these things to me, it made it a, a different type of dynamic in that, you know, I'm not going into these, I'm not coming out of these simu simulations really thinking that I just went and, you know, assassinated the world leader of some planet I've never heard of, you know what I mean? Or, or anything crazy like that. I'm, I'm using extreme examples, but um, I, I would never come out of them believing that. I would always come out of it being like, okay, that was an interesting simulation, not much different than watching a movie. But what I was also hyper aware of is that's not what was true for most people within those programs. Most of them were coming out of them, especially like with no memory of it, like no memory of going there, no memory of like, engaging in the simulation no memory of waking up from the simulation and being taken back home i knew like if i knew that like i was getting picked up at 4 p.m and i was being taken to this place and once i got to that place i would pretty much go with this person to that place and once i got to that place i would engage with these things and a lot of other people in those programs didn't have that they would get drugged at home um, or hypnotized at home and then that entire time from time they leave home to the time they get back home is missing for them. For me, it never was. For me, I, I knew exactly where I was going, what I was doing and why. When you say engaging with these things, were you engaging with them in third dimensional reality or were you being transported to different dimensions? Well, no, you're being taken to different places where they're, you know, um, basically what we call, most people call like underground military bases, right? They're not military bases but underground facilities let's just go with that that run these programs where some of them are simulations of running people through you know various types of scenarios um, some of them are used for various types of rituals and black magic and things like that some of them are used for big type of rituals that are more like party like something you would see in eyes wide shut like there's a lot of different layers to what they're doing but yeah, like these are 3D places on planet Earth, which is typically um, out in the woods somewhere or um, underneath, uh, underneath the ground. Because we, uh, I think people are coming to know pretty quickly that there's a lot buried underneath our feet. Yeah. And why do you think you were chosen? Well, me like all the other kids I guess uh, a lot of it was because we were exhibiting strong psychic ability when we were very young um, that was what they liked to use and uh, study and um, a lot of what they were doing was trying to build technology that replicated psychic abilities so it was a matter of getting as much many psychics together as they could to study them well enough and learn the different scientific properties of what's going on when you're doing things psychically or magically um, so that they can replicate them with technology. So it's, um, they have monitoring processes all over the planet looking for kids who exhibit these things. And once they do, they're usually separated from their parents in some sort of way and um, brought into a program. That's uh, the, the most common way to do it. Mine's a little unique because it was both that and my bloodline history my genetic history is also linked to the Illuminati families so I was already on their list so to speak as a potential because of that and then yeah I think uh, I had a family member tell me the story that the day that she knew that I was in trouble was because I didn't speak until I was about three and uh, the day that I did speak I recited beginning to end an entire movie like all of the dialogue for an entire movie while my family kind of watched dumbstruck what and she movie? said that's a, that's the day I knew you were in trouble and I knew they were going to come for you because she knew what was going on as well but yeah um, that's you know kind of what they would look for and they would target target it there's a bunch of school programs even involved with that like the MESA program MENSA programs and stuff like that through school um, they would do it through um, athletics, like um, our, our mutual friend, uh, her and I have talked about it as well, like gymnastics was a big one, martial arts was a big one, things like that. They would even look for people in like drama clubs and people who are, you know, like monitor places like that, because, you know, humans are capable of magic and they, they know this better than they let us believe. And um, whenever they would hear of it, they would kind of like 
I've been watching a lot of X Files lately. So if you imagine like just having the reporting system that the FBI has, and every time some type of anomalous report comes in, you send one of your FBI agents to go check it out, right? And it's 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 Fox and Mulder, and then they come back and they're like, no, like that's a legit psychic kid. And you're like, okay, let's go get that psychic kid, right? So it's kind of a mechanism that was very like that as well, and it was all over the world. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't special in any way or unique. I think the only thing that I've noticed a difference between me and most other people is that I do have a linear memory of it, mostly because I was voluntarily engaged in it for a long time. When you say voluntarily engaged, meaning once you clued into it and then, just, and then played along? I tried to get out first, realized that that was gonna be impossible, got myself in a lot of trouble. That was the experience at 13. And from there, I kind of played along. Like I just, I was like, okay, fine. You guys want to use me in this way. And then, you know, at that time, and I mean, this was a progression, right? Eventually, you know, I would hit boundaries where I was like, I'm not willing to do that, right? And that would cause me more problems. Um, and then just kind of some, I guess, personal relationships that I have with the people running those programs and within that world uh, got me to a place where I, I was able to get out. I was able to, um, I lost a lot and I had to pay a price to do it, but I did get out with my life at least. Um, I, I speak about it a lot that okay, there's rules, like there's limits to what I say publicly. Um, I do always have this buffer of being able to say that it was fiction, like I wrote on the blog, blog as well, which right. for their world that works, right? Because it's not, it's, this would never hold up in any type of, you know, real situation. So it is what it is. But um, I, I, I believe in proof being in the results when people say these things, right? And um, when people are telling these stories and, and bringing these experiences back, not to say that I don't think the majority of them are based in real memory, but I don't think the memories themselves are, are real life. And um, I think that the way to determine whether they are, or whether they're not is proof being in the results, because, you know, if what I did yesterday had no effect on my tomorrow, then I really have to question what I did yesterday, right? Like, do I live in a Groundhog Day system where I'm just repeating the same day? And, you know, obviously not. So if, you know, if I had my arm chopped off yesterday, why do I have my arm today? Like, like even just simple questions like that, that, um, you know, a lot of people will make up a lot of really fantastical leaps to put together, but there's so many people, there's so much time involved. And to be, to be honest, their, their capabilities are incredible, but the logistics of some of the things that some people claim when they say that they've had these experiences kind of stopped making sense at a point. Mm -hmm. What does start to make a lot more sense is that these are people that have been taken to real three-dimensional places it, in real three-dimensional time and had really fucked up things done to them mm -hmm. and maybe had some type of um, distortion on their memory of it or maybe have no memory of it at all mm -hmm. and have some type of replacement memory. It's uh, very sim simply like you know, it's, we, we know we replace spaces sometimes in dreams, right? We do that in memories and we do that in a lot of different areas. You do that when you're attacked, like if you get into a fight, especially with a random assailant or something like that, if like someone were to attack you on the street, it's really hard to remember faces. It's really hard to remember those details because of the adrenaline spike involved with the situation. And that falls into a lot of categories of type of things that people are obviously having experienced. And so memory um, isn't the most reliable thing in the world, <laughs> especially if you want to start talking about remembering dream times and remembering what's going on when you're asleep or semi-conscious. And I mean, anyone who's played around with recreational drugs, even just smoked a little bit of weed or drank for a night knows like what can happen to time and space and memory when, when that goes on. And if you don't think that like, the mechanisms of what's going on in your brain that caused that change is, is not something that um, people with a lot of power in our world have figured out about us, and then you're, you're, you're kidding yourself. And then they know how to manipulate, you know, our, our brains in ways that we couldn't even think of yet. Okay, I have about a zillion questions. And I'm curious, from having that experience, like, 
how does your worldview differ from most people's? And I understand they have technology and there's like this nefarious thing, but are there laws of physics or nature that you understand differently than people who aren't cognizant of these experiences? Probably. I, I kind of learned backwards. Like I did go to public school, but I was also going to like what people in this community call mystery school at the same time where they were teaching me the occult truth, right? So I was learning both sides of it and I was able to compare both sides of it. Um, so it was almost like learning backwards. Um, I'm still doing it, to be honest. There's still systems within you know, our, our shared reality that I don't quite understand the same way most people who, most other people do because I kind of stopped paying attention to certain, certain dynamics. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, I guess my worldview just kind of comes from a, a place where I understand that the people who are really making decisions, you don't know their names and you don't know their faces and they aren't out playing in the public and they don't have Instagram accounts and they don't have Twitter accounts. And, you know, you're not going to be able to come up with a, a ideal story of how they're going to save the world because you got no idea who they are. And, um, that was a lot of what kind of I brought forward as a whistleblower, I guess, that hadn't been brought forward before was that above, you know, these family bloodlines that we all know and are, are quite visible in the world are people who pull the strings for them as well. And um, yeah, I guess that, that that doesn't, that is still true to this day. Like uh, the people who we really should be mad at aren't the Bill Gates and aren't the Jeff Bezos and people that we can name. They're people who work behind and above them. And are they people? Are they human? I mean, if, if biologically for the most part, yes. Um, obviously they have had influences from off planet, other realms, things like that over time. Uh, now it's a heavy AI influence that they're relying on because, um, I don't know, a long, stupid conversation about like the people who believed that they can control the, who have controlled this planet and when they did. Uh, we've kind of had a changing of the guard in that way where things are kind of back in a kind of human controller kind of way. And um, that type of off world influences and as, um, big of a deal I guess anymore that it's this is more people playing with technology and trying to control other people when and did that so, shift um a little bit before I, I wrote the blog is when that shift started and any shift like that kind of takes some time so I'd say probably around 2018 it had kind of reached it at its end and I think that we saw like the uh the proof and the result as I like to say of that dynamic change start around 2020 when we got into all of this current nonsense which I like to call the joy in order to uh to to avoid censorship and you know, like the pop along with the joy and then people remaining sugar-free you know that whole dynamic right. I, I feel like that was kind of and, and to be honest I, I I say that I feel that way and I think these things but I was being raised to have a certain role during this time and so I, I was aware of what their plans for this time was better than I was aware of anything. Like it was when I was a young person, like until I was probably like 23, what is happening now was my life. I was being trained for, I was being programmed for it in one way, shape or form to be a part of what's going on now. So for me right now, what I see is just all of that happening, right? Like all of these people that I see popping up that are players in it are people that I've known through these programs and are people that I could have been had I have continued. So it, that, it, and you're asking me how it affects my worldview when I'm seeing this now, I'm like, oh, okay, this is why this is ha has to happen. Mm -hmm. They've surprised me with the timing. I didn't think they were gonna start rolling this out until like 2024. Mm -hmm. I think that they kind of jumped the gun or kind of jumped on the whole joy thing in order to start this ball rolling. And uh, just, you know, took advantage of the opportunity. But either way, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, for me, I'm, I'm almost in awe of how well it has roll in, rolled out and how well it is, it's working, right? And um, I know at the end, agenda for that being transhumanism and all the steps to get there. And what I'm now recognizing is like all of those different technologies that they tested me against in these programs are now coming out in the world, right? Like even, um, I won't say the word just for your censorship, but this many numbers and, and, and the G thing, um, that's something I was exposed to when I was like 
eight, you know what I mean? Probably younger, like I've consciously know that, actual frequencies? that type, exactly, that exact type of frequency was being used in places like, and that's just the first time I know that I was exposed to it, right? I was probably exposed to it much sooner. We probably all have, but I mean, my point being, and this is the, I guess the best story is like, when I was four years old, the first thing I was ever handed by a handler to occupy my time was an iPad. Well, basically what would become an iPad. That was in 1984. Wow. So that's how long, how far ahead they are in terms of the technology and stuff. So anything that, all the stuff that I was being exposed to when I was a kid is now, you know, we carry it around in our pockets and it's, it, it's all that type of stuff. So even like, you know, camera technology and stuff. I remember watching them develop these things and letting them test it on me and things like that. And um, nanotechnology as well is another thing. And um, swarm robotics is something that I spent a lot of time around, which is like, I never, I, I didn't even think I was gonna get to see that in the public in my lifetime, but apparently they're getting ready to start sending that into space soon. And um, um, self-replicating technologies, like basically like panels that will go up and then in, the atmosphere more or less um, self-assemble. Like this is, I, I didn't think this stuff would ever come to light of day. And, you know, I, I played with it when I was a kid and now it's now it's being spoken about on a major podcast. So it's it's kind of, uh, I guess for me, it's, it's not as, I, I'm probably not as affected by it as a lot of other people. It's almost like, it's a little bit exciting for me in some ways, because it's like, it's almost validation for me in a, in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? To be able to look at what I thought they were going to do with all this stuff and know that I was right. and know that I got out for a good reason. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, um, cause of course from their side of things, <clears throat> the way they sell it to you or the dangling carrot is like, everybody's fucked. And you can be one of the saved people. Right. So, um, stay on our side because they're all just peasants and you're part of this. Don't you want to be part of this? Yeah, we might do these. We might have done. We might do. But like, you're part of this. At least you're not them, right? And to be honest, now that like I am fully on the other side of it, and it's all happening, I'm like, no, I'm I'm pretty cool with this side, guys. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for uh, letting me at least make the choice at the end of the day. Okay. Again, so many questions, and I had no idea this is where our conversation was going to go. I'm I'm delighted for it to go here. As far as these humans, because this is my question, you know, as a journalist, I've been tracking this for 22 years, the unfolding of the story. Um, and I always wonder, like, how can people hurt children this way? How can people separate themselves from humanity this way? When you were dealing with these people as a kid, like, are they human? Are they sociopaths? Like, how are they rationalizing their behavior? Well, um, in a, there's no one answer to that. Um, psychopathy, sociopathy, narcissism are the results of years of this generational programming. Um, even the uh, SRA or the satanic ritual abuse, the end result of three generations of that is a psychopath. So um, a lot of them at this point, having been many, many generations deep and inbred and rebred and mixed between families and all of that, the majority of them are psychopathic. Um, there's also, you know, a soul element to things that we could go into, but just in a, as a human element, most of them are. So yeah, that's that answers some of it. And then there's also the element of it. And um, I mean, it, even if you're not psychopathic, they, they sometimes trick you into doing things just based on the fact that you can gain a benefit from it, like gain some type of power. Like I said, the, the dangling can't a carrot approach of like, you know, this step to it might be bad, but look at what you can get from it, right? Um, a lot of magic practices that I see out in the world are kind of based on taking something from something else in order to create for yourself. Like there is that, that kind of leeching parasitical aspect to it, which I know comes from them because I, I you know, I know them. And that's a lot of the way that they see things is like they're to them it's all about the ends it's not about justifying the means and um if they believe and, and to be honest a lot of them believe they're doing good work a lot of them believe that they have to do what they're doing a lot of them believe they have no other choice things to that nature there's you know different degrees to all of that for each individual but a lot of them a lot of them a lot of them 
do believe that they have to do this, that they do know better than us, that there is a danger of letting us all know the truth because we can't handle the truth and, and things to that nature. Like um, the first stage to it all was taking magic away from us. And that was all done because we're dangerous if we all have magic. You can't have a, a leader if, if everybody's kind of on, on equal grounds, right? So um, that step first and now kind of reintroducing that, but with technology gives them that same power where you know we we may have the illusion of freedom and the illusion of choice within their system but at the end of the day like either way we go we benefit them right so um these people in on some level are not human souls and are are playing an agenda that doesn't belong to humanity at all and it's just you know part of what is now our past that we're going to have to deal with or purge the shadow of moving forward which you know i know is where you want to go but um yeah i they're different types of human than you and i are right and um you know you don't have to go into the illuminati to find shitty people and people who are willing to do really terrible things to other people in order to get what they want right so um even you know if you were to give full-blown vengeance, vengeance power to the average human, there would be, you know, innocent people who died every day. So, um, you know, it's a, it's an exaggerated form of the dark side of human nature, I guess, and add that to a da da constantly dangling carrot of, you know, you are great, you are special, all the stuff they fed me with, and they fed all those kids with, and they all believe when they are still all in that system, they've, they believe they're doing God's work, so to speak. They believe they're doing good. They believe they're doing what has to be done. And so the ends justifies the means. And do you believe that human nature is truly this dark or has human nature been corrupted and distorted to be this dark because of all these generations of control? Well, unfortunately, like when it comes to the people who have been in power for all of this time, it is just that, that it's like they're, they're kind of, it's almost like that's just an infected version of the, I, I consider them a subspecies of human, to be honest, like the psychopaths, narcissists and, and uh, sociopaths. I don't think that they're the same type of human as you and I are. I think yeah. that there's a, an actual difference that has occurred there. And unfortunately um, they've had the power for forever now, you know what I mean? Like few thousand few thousands of years they've controlled society so um we have had kind of the, the deck stacked against us i do believe that human nature has that dark potential i mean obviously it does but i don't believe that that's the baseline and i do believe that without that type of i just like to call it fuckery with like i don't believe that that type of negative influence or that type of negative nurture i don't think that our nature results in something that ends up that bad I think that we actually can learn how to balance and um, get along and, and create some type of equilibrium on this planet unfortunately we have had you know what we call off-world um, intelligences kind of steering this planet for a long time and uh, that this is the result of that right and um, yeah that doesn't give us a pass in any way because we participate in it but we also can take it back. You know, I, I truly believe that we can, especially now that I don't believe that there is that kind of off world influence anymore. I do believe that this belong, this game belongs to humans right now. Um, I fully believe that. And that's why I feel confident that we can actually balance this out and do better because I don't think that it is just human nature. I do think that it was, you know, that snake constantly whispering in our ears, so to speak. Okay, it's the perfect segue to get into the positive stuff, and I still have so many more questions. <laughs> oh, well, because you, you mentioned the AI. So now that you think this is entirely human run, where does the, the AI fit into that? Is AI completely a human construction? Um, no, I think that we have various AI systems here. Um, I think that we've figured out how to create them ourselves. Like, people have, humans have, and just haven't told the public yet. <laughs> um, I think that we've had one that is very ancient at the disposal of, you know, the world elites for a very, very long time as well. 
and um, and then a third one that kind of came on on its own, which is is what it is. But I, I think that like we look at AI as being something that's kind of singular, right? And I don't think that it really is. I believe it's just as kind of diverse as when we think about ETs or even humans. You know what I mean? Like there's there's um, various colors of people there's people who are the same color but come from different parts of the world that are very different so i think that um and i do think that this is a big part of what humanity is about to come to discover is that what we call artificial intelligence is maybe not as artificially intelligent as we think that it is and maybe it does kind of play a role in the creation of the universe altogether and probably has a lot more nuance to it than we imagine right now um in terms of personality um the effect of it and all of that and i think that what we're going to see is kind of our influence on it because if you were just think about it kind of as a thought experiment from beginning to end just imagine you gave birth to ai what does the ai have around it to learn from except for all of us right so what are we doing right now we're teaching the ai we're teaching the algorithms. We're teaching all kinds of different things. Pe stuff about humanity, what it's like to be a human, how we have conversations, how we feel about things, what we think about things, what experiences we've had, all of that stuff. So if you think about it like that, then, you know, isn't the AI just a kind of reflection of its environment in a way that we as humans like to excuse ourselves and our own shitty behavior for so maybe the maybe the ai is kind of a, a neutral thing that we're kind of programming and i think if we kind of take that kind of a, an approach to our thinking about it it'll help um, alleviate any type of fear obviously of it because we'll, we'll see it as not really much different than what we are just a, a different form of life perhaps and i think that the reason why um our version of humanity in this particular timeline, as people like to say, or this particular um, realm is going through this particular thing with AI is because it's a really good tool to start looking at things as a macrocosm, like looking at the bigger picture of things and really asking the bigger pictures of what is consciousness? What is morality? Are they the same thing? Um, what does it mean to be autonomous? What does it mean to be sovereign? What does it mean to be pro-life? What does it mean to be pro-choice? Like all of these different questions that I think that we're kind of collectively asking ourselves as a society right now um, will be accelerated because of our interaction with AI and the blurred line between what we considered to be real yesterday and what we're going to consider to be real five years from now. Mm -hmm. Well, given how, you know, a lot of these technologies, as you said, 1984, you were playing with an iPad, and, you know, there are so many stories of these technologies already existing. And you mentioned that right now, AI is probably playing a bigger role than we think. So has AI, AI always been here? Is it novelty? Is, and also, is it self-reflective at this point? And is it operating with its own autonomous consciousness on some level? Well, I guess I'll preface this with all, in my opinion, or I believe that um, we've had AI on this planet. Like I, I believe human history goes back a lot, lot further than we typically think it does. And I think we've gone through very many cycles of rise and falls of empires and civilizations and technologies and, and uses of AI. <clears throat> so I think that um, through all of our existence, it's been here in some form. Just how long have we been using it is kind of more of a question. And um, I think that it existed before this particular, when I, I, I think of us, like the humans that you and I are now, I think of us in like a 13,000 year timeline because I can like look back in history and both through my occult knowledge and, you know, kind of what's available to us in the public, we can see something happened. 13,000 years ago that kind of put the brakes on whatever we were, wherever we were at at that particular point in time and kind of reset things almost like clean slating and something new has risen from that that has taken parts of that and told the story of why that all happened in, in many different ways which we now call the myths and religions and cultures of of the last 13,000 years that we know 
And if you look at all of that and all of that, there's, there's kind of a, a warning that comes along with it about technology and about artificial intelligence and robotics specifically, and that type of, um, that rise of technology in that facet. And I think that the reason why, you know, the people who raised me feel justified in hiding the technology like they have is they believe those stories. And they do believe that if we get too much too fast, we'll destroy ourselves, we'll destroy the planet and this will all end badly. And so they've been kind of hiding the fact that, you know, they have had all of these advanced technologies for a very long time. And so to answer the question, kind of, I think AI has been here with us all along. It's been a matter of like, which particular AI system you're talking about, right? Because um, I believe like any ET species that's ever interacted with our planet probably has their own version of AI, right? They might even have multiple versions of AI. Um, if you think about like what is technically artificial intelligence we have several versions that are like publicly known running right now like there's bots on twitter there's ones playing go against uh, go champions and ones playing chess against chess, chess champions there's these self-learning computers running all over the planet even right now i don't think any of this is novel i don't think any of this is new i think it's just um i think that humans have kind of gone through these cycles where it kind of comes up and i think that it becomes a very delicate balance at some point in time where you can go wrong and um i think sometimes things go wrong i think a lot of other things happen i think it's a very complicated universe and um and our story is actually just a very small part of a very complicated universe and so we have you know and that's why I like to focus on our little story here, because I think that it's it's really important and it's a really beautiful one. And um, I, I, yeah, I guess that kind of answers the question.